So welcome back to our channel. If you're just joining us, uh, this is part two of a three-part video. And if you want to go back and get caught up, there's a link up here. You can click on that and check things out. Okay, so we're going to meet back up with Sam Lenrich again. And he um, is going to take us through the Montana luxury line. And again, I want to just mention that, you know, a lot of people have submitted questions and wanted to see certain things so we're going to show you that all of this in real time just the way we got the tour so it's not going to be real entertaining on our part no and it's pretty long so hope you have patience for that and if you did submit questions or um, want to see certain things pay attention because we tried to address all of them and i apologize if we missed anybody um, and some of the things that we've seen put out on social media some of the um concerns if you will you're going to see that um, Montana's addressing those or they're at least making an attempt to do so so um, another thing is I've also seen people say that um, hey Keystone's monitoring these pages well actually they are and you'll see sometimes if you pay attention on there that Sam's actually there and he's answering questions as well as we are um, and if there's something that we can't help you with, we, we have a direct line. We can get an answer for you. So um, in the future, if you're posting on those social, social media sites, um, just know um, it's not going unseen. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, when we did a video of our one-year review of our Montana, um, one thing that we kind of asked ourselves afterwards were, we well, wonder if somebody from Keystone is going to see this. And they did. They did. <laughs> and you're going to see in there some of the changes that were made because of that. So um, just rest assured as a Montana owner, um, you're not going unheard. They're listening. So let's go meet back up with Sam and we're going to get this tour started. And uh, we'll check back in with you guys in a little while. So the big thing on the Montana stuff is we're n we don't talk about it as a right to brag. But we have put over 100,000 units RVs on the road with the Montana name tag. So, it, yes, you would think at that point we would know what to do and what not to do. Materials are ever changing and stuff like that. But we also know we're not going to stick our neck out and try something completely different like doing a, a 10 inch I-beam with reinforcement plates or something like that. So all the Montanas are built on 12 inch cambered I-beams. Um, everything here uh, at Montana is hydraulic. So uh, when it comes to your main landing gear and your actual, what we call our main floor slide outs, the great thing about hydraulic is it's fast. The downfall of hydraulic when it comes to slide outs is it's strong and it doesn't get in anything's way. So right. you're talking about a small drawer front, your hydraulic slide is not gonna stop. If there's a drawer that's come out or a door or sometimes we've seen people that forgot about a campsite and they've literally pushed something right through their entire wall uh, because there's just so much strength there. Right. So hydraulics gives you speed, it gives you strength to move a lot of stuff, but the downfall again is that there's very little resistance for it to stop when it comes abruptly to something. So basically here you've got your entire frame. When the frame comes in, no axles are on it at all. The station behind you that's empty, we do a frame flipper, we put it upside down, and we actually put the axles on it. One thing that we did a year ago was we've had a lot, a lot of customers say, why aren't you putting 8,000 pound axles on your units? If you start looking at 8,000 pound axles and H range tires, the additional rigidity that they cause then relates to the, your entire coach. And yes, they want the carrying capacity, but we also have to say, we call it a break point where we can actually manufacture a unit that you can put technically to carry so much but can the frame really do that? So yes, we could probably up our carrying capacities and things of that nature, but rather than do an 8,000 pound axle, what people were really saying is we don't want our axles to fail. They didn't want to carry more, they just didn't want them to fail. So we worked with Dexter and we came up with what we're calling the Gladiator axle. Uh, that was exclusive to Keystone for a year. Any manufacturer can use it. The Gladiator axle consists of a tube, your main axle tube, the actual gauge of that tube is 50% thicker. So if we took a knife, cut that axle right in half, the gauge, the thickness of your tube is 50% thicker. Then we took and say, for example, you have a 7,000 pound axle, you would normally have a set of 3,500 pound springs on each end. That makes your 7,000. Mm -hmm. We took and put 4,000 pound springs on it. 
So we beefed up the axle to almost what you would gauge as an 8,000 pound axle, but we didn't go to the 8,000 pound axle gigantic tube. In those things that we improved, we did not increase the carrying capacity. We made a conscious decision, we're basically gonna overbuild the product. And that was our thought, was let's, let's overbuild it, give it less of an opportunity to fail. Do we have massive failures? No. Um, do we have massive, massive axle failures? No. But we just, again, it's that one thing, like you and I talked about on the fresh water tank, does it fall out? Has it ever fallen out? Yes, but if you do a search, you're not gonna find 60, 70 people where their tank's falling out. So that's what we did with Dexter. One thing we really, really like about Dexter is we've used it for a really long time. Other manufacturers that do axles don't do it like Dexter where most of their components are built in the US. So if they find an error, they can stop that component being manufactured and correct it versus 60,000 more parts coming across the water that have the same defect. But Dexter is a great company. As far as an axle option, you could classify we offer an option when you talk about the legacy package and the disc brakes. When we added that to the legacy package, I laugh when the Dexter rep calls me is because you guys changed the industry. There were several brands up in that offered it as an option and never utilized it. Once we made it an option, most of our manufacturers have followed. Because when you get a unit with disc brakes, you never go back from what customers tell me specifically. So that's kind of an axle option, but it's tied to the legacy package. And that's the only way you can get it through it from the factory is through the legacy, legacy package. package. Yep. Now, if somebody wants to go over to say more ride yep. and have an upgrade done, they can do that Absolutely. with a regular Montana. Yep. Okay. And there's several other companies that do them. I see a lot of customers doing that. It doesn't have to be more ride. There's some, some obviously axle people. When we have our Montana owners club rally here, I see them doing literally in the yard there, put disc brakes um, right on the coach right there. Okay. You don't have to go all the way to disc brakes and independent suspension. Again, that's the cream on top. The ultimate okay it's but, not one package you can get one or the other or both yeah okay. well, well with more ride you probably go disc brakes and independent but there's people out there that you can put disc brake hubs on without changing your entire suspension okay so there is a lot of that going on um saloon tires we use all g-rated saloon tires um, one thing that we added for 2022 was we partnered with tst and we put a pressure monitoring system on standard this year that's awesome so, not only did we do that, but we even made the next step. It was my decision to whether save the money or spend it. I spent the money and we put a pressure sensor on the spare tire. Now we know that's not going to be doing anything with heat, but the big thing is pressure, right? When you want right. that spare tire, you want to make sure it's pressured up. So your alarm system, if that goes down in air pressure at all, you're going to know it. You're going to know to maintain it. Perfect. Now, so, did you guys do, is, is that system that comes with the Montana, is that the cap or the pass through? sensors on there it's, pat, it's the sensors that are deemed what they call banded sensors so you'll never see them they're actually when they get when we get our wheels the actual sensor is inside and banded to the rim it's oh. inside your tire okay perfect so you don't have nobody has to install anything right and it's okay. battery powered they said the batteries last up to five years when the unit goes down the line the question would be well how do you know it's actually in there they provide us with an actual device that senses that it's in there and tells us that it's in there Okay. So that's how we verify it. So then all you have to do is you have to actually, you, it comes with another display and you actually put that in your truck and you program that for your, for your configuration. Two main reasons I did it. One was I watch customers like yourself that get one and you even made the comment, when you have a blowout, it's not a tire replacement. Mm -hmm. And I see so many customers I started watching, they said, hey, I have a tire pressure monitoring system and it stopped me from having major damage. Right. And it's like, man, we gotta we gotta not give the customers an option whether they're gonna put it on or not, because they'll be happier owners. And you put that question out there like as a survey on one of the Facebook groups that I read, would you be willing to pay a little bit extra in the total purchase price of your, you know, rig if it had this on there? And mm -hmm. everyone's like, Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. TST has the best customer service. That's the other thing we talked about earlier. You're gonna get that display. We would like for our dealers to take that display out and set it up for you. So all you have to do is put it in your truck. There are some chances that may not happen. TST has a full uh, group of people that are available at any time for you, the customer, to call directly and get it set up if you have problems. The other thing we liked about it is TST has so many aftermarket parts. So you're always gonna be using the same truck. Very inexpensively, you can go buy four more sensors for your snowmobile trailer, or you might buy two sensors for your lawnmower trailer and you use the same display. You just go to trailer two, trailer three, whatever trailer number you've put right. on that, and you can have an unbelievable amount of, of 
sensors and setups. Right. Yeah, and for so, us having a 2020, obviously it wasn't available then. Correct. We put it on ours, and it, it, we don't move the truck without that being turned on. Yeah. Because, like you said, it, it's going to save you a lot of damage. Just watching the temperature will mm -hmm. tell you if you're at risk for, or if you've got a hub heating up or something like that. So it's going to tell you more than just the pressure of the tire. So that was definitely a, a, a good addition and, from and, Montana. And the reason was we went to the banded system, banded and the sensors on the T's, they're both great systems, but we have to also address our screw-ons. They would have walked away. Exactly. Oh, yeah. yeah. At the dealership, they would have not been there on delivery. You would have had a display. Now you're frustrated. You're so excited about getting your new Montana, but the sensors are gone. Yeah. So what's the what's somebody do? They go steal the sensors off of another one. It's just like it's a just domino snowballs. effect. Yeah. yeah. These aren't going to disappear. Yeah. And uh, very rarely have they actually yeah. had a customer that's ever called TST and said, "Hey, the battery's dead. I need another one." But the reason I want to bring it up is if you were to ever replace your rims. Unless you're going to take the bands off and transfer them and put them in before you put your new tires on, obviously you're going to lose them. So, well, it's a good addition. Yep. So the other things we do in this area, obviously, we still use the road armor suspension system. Um, let me grab one of those real quick. One of the things we did was on suspension. We know independent suspension is you know, the best. So we had a suspension system we we're using that basically utilizes this rubber hockey puck or rubber hard membrane. And it would absorb when the levers would actually go one direction. So if it would come up, it would hit those and rest. But if they went to the bottom direction or vice versa, it would actually bottom out steel on steel. So we kind of said, why not take the one concept, take it times two, and now you have 360 degrees of that absorption system. And that's where road armor came from. So we do this, this is a Lippert product. Also, I want to make note that you know you got brass bushings, not right. plastic. Right. And then this is incorporated or joined with your actual wet bolts and then your thick shackles. It's all standard. So, astrofoil. Astrofoil is a great insulation factor because it can't mold or mildew, can't absorb water. It gives you a great bounce factor, which means that actually any amount of heat that you put in here will bounce around and go into the area that it is. Our tanks are all heated with pads and heated with your furnace. So right. the 12 volt pads are on as a standard feature. Again, we test our units down to zero degrees and make sure that they can operate. Do we really hope people camp in zero degrees? No, we hope you're going to somewhere where it's warm. Right. But, we, <laughs> but we have tested them down to that point. Sometimes people ask, why don't you go down below zero if it will go that far? Because statistically, there are some appliances. When you get down to zero, your refrigerators won't even operate if it's a gas electric refrigerator. One of the things that Keystone has taken a stance on, again, is the approach to the consumer, you. And that's in, we all use insulation. And the insulation R factors in brochures have gotten out of hand in the past several years. Anybody that has any construction background knows every RV's roof cavity at most is five, might be somebody with six inches. You can't get an R factor of 28 in that size cavity. As you compress and compress insulation in the cavity, your R factor actually gets less. Right. That's why you'll see a lot of manufacturers will have an asterisk and they'll say R equivalent. That isn't even a scientific term. So what Keystone has taken the stance is if you ask us, number one, we're going to test it down to what we feel is a suitable, usable temperature. Number two, we're going to tell you the insulation we use. We're not going to give you this combined R factor. We're going to tell you we use two layers of R14 insulation in the roof. That does not equate to R28, but most manufacturers say that it does. This right here has a natural R factor, but on the bounce factor, it can say it can accelerate it up into the R30s and beyond. Some people count that. We're just gonna tell you the components we use. We're gonna test the product to make sure that it operates. So that's been a big change. You're not gonna see these big R factors in Keystone brochures any longer. Um, fresh water tanks. So all of our tanks are rotocast molded, whether it's a holding tank or a fresh water tank. Rotocast meaning that you can watch a YouTube on it, how it's made, put a resin in a big mold, spins, heats up, makes you a seamless tank. Uh, one thing that we do on our freshwater tanks is we actually incorporate what we call a baffle. What the baffle does is you can see this tank, I actually have a hole that goes completely through. Now it does two things. It acts as a baffle, so if the water was to slosh left to right, it's going to break it up. You're not going to get that big jerk of all that water. The other thing it does is it actually marries the bottom of the tank to the top of the tank. So now this tank can't bellow. It can't get bigger 
because it's fighting the bottom and the top at the same time. So it does two really good things. You'll see that in any tank of a certain size, you'll never see that in a black tank because we don't want stuff hanging up, right? Right. So it's mostly in the fresh water tank. We'll also put a 12 volt pad on this tank for your heat. And again, that's also thermostatically controlled. We get that customer ask that question a lot of time. It's built in. You can leave those tanks on all the time. It doesn't mean they're going to be on all the time. Oh, that's good information. I didn't know yeah. that. So it's not so. like always on making you hot water in your tanks. It actually has a temperature control that will kick it on and off. That's good to know. So, so and of course, they still have the, the pads for the sensors for the level indicators. Um, has Montana ever looked at any other system that yep that's one of the biggest things one of the biggest complaints people have is their indicator lights never work right mm -hmm. and so i know there's some aftermarket products where there's a pad that goes on each tank but i don't know a lot of people they're going to pull their underbelly apart to get to their tank to install that on a fifth wheel right so our engineering department that's on on our list of the things that we want to continue to do there's been the sea level stuff. There's been a lot of stuff that's, uh, a lot of it's based on pressure. Right. You know, and the pressure, but then they want you to have a pressure gauge that really most people want to know, is it full, half full, a quarter full? Exactly. They don't want to know that 62.5% PSI means it's three quarters full. Right, exactly. So that's the thing is, it's on our list. We know it's a priority. Yes, we're trying to, but we need to get something developed. The other thing too is people also want this to not only, they don't want it to be elementary, they want it to have some technology where it can work with in command, it can work with apps. So that's kind of a thing that's tough to develop, but it's on our list. It definitely is. Good to know. So another big question you had was freshwater tanks, securement of freshwater tanks. Yeah. So we're gonna go up on this other one and we're gonna see if we can, if I can show you all of it. So securement of freshwater tanks, right? So the big thing was every time we would have a securement of a water tank it was how many steel shelves can we put under the water tank right how can we secure it so it never comes out and at some point in time you find well you know it, it's sloshed this way it moved that way what was the one way we can make sure that this thing never comes out i don't know why we didn't think of it sooner and that's straps those straps will that tank will never fall out of that the only way it's going to fall out is if those strength, those straps can somehow become frayed and actually tear. Because what is was happening was the tank, sometimes you have like a, you saw on the backside where you have actually right here, we have a little bit of a low spot so it drains right. Right. How do you make steel conform to that? You can't. But you can make a strap wrap all the way around it no matter what the tank is. Even here you can see where we put special plastic so that it's not against the steel to make sure that that doesn't wrap or actually wear steel on there, this is gonna make sure that that strap doesn't deteriorate or fray. Why we didn't think of strapping sooner? We still have all the steel shelves. You can see these ledges that they set on. Yeah. You would ask yourself, how in the world would it ever come off of that? You know, there's a, there might be that one that could, but this, these straps will stop that from happening. How long has this process been in? We started in mid last year. Okay, so anything 2021 or newer mm -hmm. is strapped in. Yep. So what would you say to somebody with, say, a 2020 like myself? Am I still probably in there with I would say you very see, little risk yes, of losing very my little risk. Um, if I was going to say if I ever had the underbelly down for any type of a maintenance or you had a dump leak or a leak like this, with knowing that my floor is going to rest on here and you still have this air pocket, I would fish a strap through there. If it's a ratchet strap, if it's a tension strap, um, the benefit of this, this strapping is just, I mean, I again, I don't know why we didn't think of it sooner. Because it can marry itself to the bottom of the tank. It doesn't matter what the contour is. It's going right. to hug to it. Right. So. Okay. I think that answers the questions that we yeah. were getting on some yeah. of the social media pages. This is, I'm going to assume this is the galley gray water tank. Yes. In the front. Yes. And just to give you guys or give our viewers, this is where they dump out in the back of the tank. And it looks like all of them dump out from the back. So I think I saw somebody give a video once before where they recommend if you really want to get your tanks dumped completely to lift the front end. So that's still the case where the dumps are coming out the rear of the tanks. And the one thing that we try and do is notice that the dump, the actual knife valve, is absolutely as close as we can get it to the tank. That dump valve could be setting here at this location 
and down here and then you would just have stuff laying in there right we want that valve all the way back as much as we can to have nothing laying in here that doesn't have to be and that explains why when i'm dumping even after i close my valve it's going to run for a little bit because mm -hmm. it's emptying out those pipes yep so it's not that you have a leak it's it's going to run for a little bit absolutely now we have had a lot of customers you know push buttons the day of the age right who would ever thought we'd have push button awnings Right. You guys had right. pop-ups and stuff oh, of that yeah. nature. Yep. And when somebody came out with electric on it's like, no way, that's never going to fly. Yeah. You know, people can't strap them down. They can't do their thing. Can't do it without it. So the reason I bring that up is a lot of people have said, I wish that maybe like a legacy or you offered electric gate valves. Mm -hmm. The issue we have every time we've tried to proto them is the override side of it. How do we make it? So now you're really mad because your electric valve doesn't work. How do you get to the valve? with an access hatch that's acceptable to override it because now the electric doesn't work. Right. So when we've protoed it and showed it to customers and said, oh, here's your brand new Montana and they look underneath it, it's got these three drop down doors. They're like, I don't want that. I want solid underbelly. What are those doors for? What did you guys break? What did you repair? What did you cut into? And it's like, you gotta have those to override your electric dump valves. No, not interested. I'll do poles. I don't want that open like that. So. That's some of the feedback and comments we've got when we have tried some things. Okay. So it's customer feedback that make you just yeah. trash a concept. Well, not only that, but again, is is it the masses that really want it or is it a small group? So right. it's still a very easy aftermarket. Ironically, the guy that's going to do an aftermarket is going to have to cut the hatches. Right, exactly. So he's made the decision that's okay with me. Right, yeah. So. so you've asked about floor construction. So the actual floor is two by three tubular aluminum tubes that are welded into a frame and that's what's on the furthest rack. Then that actually gets the, what most people call Darko, which is a vapor barrier. That's laid down first in single sheet. Then insulation, the insulation for your floor, it's not put between the stubs or studs because we want to actually put a barrier and try and stop the cold from conducting. When that insulation is laid, it's a blanket meaning that it's laid all the way down and across. Then the frame's put on top. Then we put in your heat plenum system. The heat plenum is still so important to us. We have a lot of brands and, and other competitors that have talked about, we really, really want to get the vent out of the floor. We do understand the perception that that's better. But every time we have tried to run a proto with that type of a construction in Montana, the CFMs, the amount of air that comes out of it, is not acceptable. Most furnace manufacturers, if you give them the results of that, they will make you sign off that you know that this is not acceptable, you're not getting the right CFMs, and the manufacturer will say, hey, we think it's more important to not have the actual uh, vents in the floor, so we'll put up with low CFMs. And you see that all the time online of other brands. When you have a sofa all the way up here and the next closest spot they can put a vent is in the island, that's all areas that you get cold and drafty sure so we still do the residential plenum which is an aluminum box that's between the studs ran full length and that's where all of your heat comes out of then we actually glue and screw down your 5 8 inch one piece floor we use dynaspan 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 comes in a 24 foot length piece is the longest you might have one seam if you have the longest floor plans we build for example your model would have no seams it's yeah. all one piece. Why Dynaspan and not plywood? If anybody's went and bought the most expensive sheet of five ply plywood at Lowe's and you cut into it for something at your house, all of a sudden you see the plies, there's voids, there's plugs. Everything on this RV, a high percentage of it is screwed to this floor. When we walk this production line, the walls are screwed to the floor. Your cabinets are screwed to your floor. Everything's screwed down to this floor. The screw retention advantages of this type of OSB board is far beyond any plywood. And that's why we really rely on it. And plus we don't get the creaking of the seams and it gives us a little bit of a flexibility as a panel. So that's why we use Dynaspan besides their lifetime guarantee on the product that the product won't fail. Yeah, so one of the things that we found with Montana when they with the early, early product of Montana was how do we stop people from freezing it and really make the water lines really make it a a four season coach. The number one thing that was freezing fifth wheels was the two main water lines. People would take them directly through the floor and run them through that frame area. Right. We can't insulate the conduction that comes from those I-beams into that. 
And all of a sudden those would get too close and they would freeze. Our two main water lines, we actually run in the floor. There's no connections from there. So like you don't have to worry that there's a bunch of connections in this floor that could, could leak. Any of the plumbing that's in the floor is a solid one piece. One piece for cold, one piece for hot. But that keeps it out of that underbelly where it could get conducted up against steel and get cold and freeze. So. Well, that should give some people some peace of mind. Yeah. So. So then that entire floor is lifted and placed onto the unit. And that's what you see right here. So again, one of the misnomers in the RV industry is you glue all of the linoleum down. That's not the installation instructions for RVs. RVs, your linoleum, again, I can't speak for every brand, but is you actually glue around your actual vent holes, then you stretch your linoleum and you actually secure it at the outbound edge. And that's how the linoleum is laid. Okay, so if you get, like, say, the slides are going in and out, and you, from time to time you see a little pucker, that's why. Yeah, as far mm -hmm. as a move, yes, right. that will come, will come and go away. Two reasons why we do that is this does have to grow and contract. I'd say there's about four years ago that most manufacturers were using what they called residential linoleum. Nobody took the RV industry in the, in the consideration. Cold cracking. Everybody that was in Alberta and mostly Canada and the real cold states, I mean, cold cracking just started to take over the industry. And that's because there was no flexibility. They were actually gluing it down too much. It couldn't move. Okay. This thing's sitting in storage. You know, in some states, it'll set and freeze inside here overnight. And then outside will be 80 degrees by the time mid-afternoon. Nobody's opened the RV. The air's never gotten to be able to exchange. So right. there's a lot of dynamics besides the earthquake that RVs go through. So one of the things we talked about earlier that I just want to talk about on customer basis is if they ever get a situation where their linoleum is blowing up, it's an easy fix. Honestly, something they can do on their own. If they take up their heat vent and that little boot, and they move that boot and they go to the go to the linoleum and they can feel where any of that linoleum is lifted up and maybe squirt some glue in it and then put that back down, somehow air has found an opportunity to get underneath the linoleum and just blow it up. That's what it's done, that's it. So if you put a little bit of glue back around that or even some double tape, your solution is, is done. You didn't have to drag your fifth wheel all the way to the dealer. So Yeah, that's pretty inconvenient. Yes. <laughs> and a lot of customers we give on the tours start talking about, we start building the RV, RV inside out. Right. You know, there's things that, everything you should be able to get through a window or a door, but one of the things you can't, and we anchor ourselves on this feature is the true residential fiberglass shower. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of industries out there that are doing printed plastic shower walls. And we, again, it's this eye grabber when the women walk in there. Maybe we'll have to go to it at some point and someday. But the fiberglass, a lot of times people say, well, how would I ever replace that? Have you ever replaced one in your house unless you're remodeling? The idea is to repair it. It's going to be there forever. It's like the mm -hmm. nose of a boat. It's anything that can be repairable. And uh, it's not going to need to be silicone. It's not going to gap. It's not going to warp. You're not going to put rivets in the walls. We anchor ourselves on there. The only unfortunate part is it's not real pretty. It's white or it's bisque or it's gray, right, right. but it's fiberglass. So but, that needs to get in at this point because it's not going to go through the door. Well, it's one piece. It's maintenance free and it's easy to clean. Absolutely. So, I mean, the color really is... Yep. Irrelevant to me, yeah. unless it's something really gaudy. <laughs> but really, you're usually the guy that doesn't really care about the color. It's usually right. her that says, exactly. have you seen that shower in the X brand? I mean, it looks like slabs of granite. Right. And it's, you know. And it's, it's got the teak little bands. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. One of the things that we did for 2022, and this came actually off of a post, um, and the gentleman knows who he is. He actually in, installed one of the C-Flow pumps. This CFO pump is 12, 12 decibels quieter, yeah. as you know. Oh. Yep. Is this standard with Montana's now? Yep, for 2022. There you go. Yep. So we made that change. Not only we we change it on Montana, but we also changed it on high country. So A lot of changes I've seen to high yeah. country. And again, fully based on customer input. I mean, watching you what you guys had said. Um, because if it was all on numbers, I believe if you were a scientist, this probably has a little bit less pressure. Hmm. But when I started reading about the DB, it's like, prototype it and again yeah. that's the thing is where i didn't actually just say change we have a process i protoed it sent it to engineering bay they db tested it they had to test because as you know we've got some floor plans where our bathrooms in the back corner mm -hmm. can this get enough pressure back there right so we don't just say hey let's try it we heard it's great we do put it through its tests but so there you go just another example of we try customer input we try the furnace um, again, we do color-coded wiring. 
We're still trying to work on one of the big things is zip tie your wiring together, make it prettier in the, in the cabinets, stuff like that. I know it's important to customers. Um, I think we made a big step in doing color coding. So if you do have to diagnose a problem, um, you can easily do that. Say for example, if the blue white goes to the exterior speaker on a Montana, it goes to the exterior speaker on a hideout. It goes to the exterior speaker on a Cougar. We use that matrix or that master color across our entire company. Uh, ultimately it will help if you do need that, that service on electrical. So here they'll start to set some of that stuff. And again, these are all manually pushed down line. They're on mm -hmm. wheel trolleys. They yell, move the line. Everybody runs up and they push them across the line. That's all I've done. I've seen that manually. process in the past. Yeah, it's impressive. Yeah. Modern Maple, which is the gray. That's what we consider our standard decor. Okay. Then we offer and that comes in two fabrics. That comes in bourbon, which is a brown fabric. Right. Or we actually call it... Um, uh, is that something. the cobblestone? Yes, cobblestone. cobblestone. Sorry. Yeah. Um, but it's called cobblestone, which is kind of a light gray, but it's our lighter interior. Then you have a third, we call it an interior decor, which is called cottage white. The cabinets then go to mixed, and you can only get it with what we deem the brown furniture or bourbon furniture. Okay. So we don't have a total of four, and we get a lot of some yeah. requests that people say, "Man, I wish I could get the mixed cabinets with the lighter furniture." Yeah. When we've done that, customers actually call back and say, "You were right. It doesn't look that good." Doesn't look that good. Because it just makes it it makes the fabric flip to a sometimes a mint green or a color they didn't see. Well, you need something that balances. You don't want all the same tones. Yeah, light on light on light. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, while we're I, talking about that as far as customers wanting to make changes or or I want this but I don't want this package but I want this option in this package if you could just touch a little bit on why that's really not feasible to do that like for instance just had a question that a customer wanted disc brakes but they didn't want the legacy package mm -hmm. so obviously there's cost involved in that there there's cost but the other thing that it does is it still is a, a an RV built by hands and repetitiveness is our friend. Right. And not having individual options causes the customer to not get his unit and it's missing this, but he ordered that. Mm -hmm. So for example, when we did the legacy package, we knew we had a percentage of Montana past owners and, current, and new owners that wanted a power cord reel. And we also knew that people that wanted full body paint also wanted disc brakes. So you can't get full body paint without getting legacy, which gives you disc brakes. So time, sometimes we have to group stuff together because there's no way this production line could give you the quality that we're trying to get better at and run efficiently. If all of a sudden I had a power cord reel option, then I had a disc brake option. Then I had a rear camera and side camera option because all three of those so far I've just listed are part of the legacy. Right. I couldn't have an, an option for surge protector, but we found there's a high percentage of people that want those all at the same time. So we were able to offer them, but we had to package them. I know it's kind of running around the cherry tree, but that allows us to actually give you some added benefit and some stuff that you don't have to rely on the dealer installing and still be able to put it in a production atmosphere. That makes sense. But, and one of the big changes I see for 2022 is you've gotten away from the two model numbers on the same floor plan. Correct. And that was kind of, from what I understand, confusing a lot of people? It was because basically they were like, um, so why are you guys doing it that way? It wasn't like an industry standard. Sure. You know, so we felt like it was better to go with the residential refrigerator as the standard floor plan and standard refrigerator with a gas electric option. Okay. The other thing was for dealer's inventory was all of a sudden – the guy really liked selling the one refrigerator and he was confused and his inventory manager didn't know one from the other. It just caused more confusion. And then okay. actually within Keystone, we had some brands that did two models and some didn't. So that really got confusing. So it, it, it's going to bring a lot more continuity to it. Um, it's, it's, we're, we're excited about, but it also can cause some confusion in the next year for shopping. Mm -hmm. You and I talked about it. A guy that has been going to RV shows, he knows he wants the 3120. He could literally feel like we stopped building it. Right, right. He's going to Google it. There's not going to be any on dealer inventory in the next months. He's going to be like, oh, man, they dropped the 3120 for 2022. We didn't. It's now a 3121 with an optional gas electric refrigerator. So 
Um, so we were in the lamination building. Ta-da! Here's that are. lamination wall um, that showed up. It's now getting ready to be set onto the actual unit by crane, not manually. Here again is an example of that multi-tube type beam that's in here. You can see here, here's a triple tube. And then before they actually set the sidewall, they're going to stuff that tube. And over here is an example of it. So they're going to actually fill two of the tubes with a pine insert. And what that allows us to do now is when we major, major anchor that front nose with the largest lag screws we have, it's now not just going through aluminum and then into blank air and then into aluminum. It's going to go aluminum to pine, aluminum to pine. And it gives That's that drawdown. Yeah. So, again, CNC routed, protected with the plastic, and it's ready to get set. And now the plug walls, when they actually get it over here, they're going to actually route out what I deem or call a plug wall. That's your outside wall of your slide outs. That's now going to go over to our right. And as this RV moves over here, the slide outs are going to move. And they're going to go down the production line at the same rate, and then they're going to come together and meet again. So you're using the same sheet on the outside of the slide out, so everything matches perfect. If there's that slight chance that they had a die lot difference, it's going to stop that from being, whoa, this one's a little grayer than that one's a little bit wider. Right. So that's important to us to keep those going down the, the production line and then coming back together, and we'll see that down here further on the line. So what I'd like to do now is we're going to jump up on the mezzanine, and we're going to talk air conditioning. So here we're going to talk about air conditioning. We know nobody likes to be in an RV when it's hot, and it's been um, a real challenge for everybody in the RV industry. We thought the solution was just, let's put more air conditioners on the roof. So we started a couple of years ago offering an optional third air conditioner, but then you got power issues, weight, everything like that. So we actually went back, I'd say it's almost been three years ago, to the drawing board of the whole system. Are we even doing the system correctly? First step was a joiner. So you got two pieces of duct. In the old day, we would actually, I'm gonna step behind you here and pull these just to give you a visual. In the old day, when these two pieces would come and join together, we'd have an employee take them like this, bite them together and wrap tape around them. That was our solution to make them a full length. Now we have this plastic coupler we've developed and patented that not only is going to join them and let us actually bond on it to tape, but it has this riser that's not going to let this smile or compress. All these people that put PVC tubing and stuff, yep, this that's eliminates what they were that. Doing. They were just trying to separate them. So the joiner slides in, other duct goes onto it, and again, I don't do this every day. Now there's no way for it to compress. They're going to bond it just like this with the with the foil tape, bond it together leaks smashes all of that's been eliminated that was our first step so huge improvements then the other thing that we used to do that wasn't good for you the customer how do you end it so then we would have the guys at the production line i'm sorry i giggled but we just smash it smash it and wrap tape then two years three years the tape would get unsticky your air conditioner would constantly be forcing air on it so we it'd come undone and then all of a sudden you'd figure out where did all my cold air go? Um, so in conjunction with this, we actually developed an end cap that's solid on the back end. It slips into there and then absolutely shuts the end of it off. Those were some of our first steps. We saw huge improvements in CFMs and performance. So then we started attacking the actual rotaire, as some people say, or the output. And that's one of the things that we saw a big improvement on. So let me grab one of those. So this is the new blade system, all of this together, and we've got a patent on it. This is the collar that actually goes into the actual cut hole. In the past, this collar would not have this lip. I know it's very, very hard to see, but this would just be a smooth collar. We would pop it up into there, and then we'd put all this tape around it. We've now developed this collar, so if they actually use, we use a certain size hole saw, which is actually smaller than the overall diameter of this. We use that hole saw, and now when we pop it up, this foam duct basically rests in that groove. In that channel. Just yeah. like that. Okay. And seals it off. So this will actually pop up there, and this will rest in that entire rim of that. 
And then we'll still put a small piece of tape, but no longer are we relying on all that tape to make the air come out. And then when we get down in the coach, I'll show you that one of the other things we did was the actual output that goes on this. There's a lot of time spent on that. And it's only in the industry, what they call a convection output. It has convection technology in it where it's actually going to make the air rather than come down in a direction based on blades, it comes down in a universal, almost like a fog through the entire coach. That way it can get into slide outs and things of that nature. And it has this scoop uh, concept on it. Now you can see our blade um, videos on our website. There's a one that's strictly on blade that talks about all this and how they engineered it. But we took it one step further. I'm gonna show you down here in a little bit. And in Montana and some of the other brands, it, we took a step up and it's now called Blade Pure. And I'm gonna show you that and it's really exciting, so. But again, this kind of shows this. Obviously, I didn't go in detail about the insulation, putting the decking on and everything of that nature. But we've seen huge improvements in, in air volume. Sounds like the research and the development and the innovation just never stops here. Well, the big thing for us is, again, this all costs and you can't see it. That's, right. that's what people that are doing what you're doing, educating the customers, sharing this information. Now you can actually put money and development time in the places that people can't see and get the value out of it. Because if you weren't here doing this video, you'd walk in, you'd see a fancier thing in the ceiling and say, oh, that's cool. Right. But now you know everything else. That's it serves a purpose. Absolutely. It serves a function. So, okay. Okay, let's move on to the next station. Do you do like a run of rear dens and a run of 3121s or? I'll usually keep the runs anywhere. We try and do um, three models, on average three models a week. Um, okay. That'll give them some days where they're really all just one model a day. Mm -hmm. But there's so many challenges because at the same time to get consistency and try and get quality as best we can, we then have to group those together. You have subgroups. So like, even though I'm building 3121s, then we subgroup those into refrigerators Okay. Then we subgroup them into decors because we don't want to jump from white and gray cabinets to gray to white and gray cabinets to gray. So we have to subgroup those. Then we have to slide in full body paint units because full body paint units going down the line get no decals. So you can't send the, the ladies and gentlemen that put the decals home for a day and say, sorry, we're doing full body paint units. Right. So you insert that and you blend those in. So, um, but we try and get at least minimum uh, of at least 20 of a model at a time. We've run as, as little as one. Um, normally we'll run, if we have like some really, really hot retails we need to get built for a, for a reason, we'll do a run of five. We've done an entire week of one model. Okay. You know, a so hundred of them all in one swap. Wow. So if somebody was to order a new unit today, I, I realized that in the circumstances we're in right now, with mm -hmm. things that have happened and supply shortages that may vary but on average how long would a customer expect to wait to have from the time they sat down with their dealer to say the factory says we're shipping shipping that unit the re i'm going to answer it this way because i think that these conditions today other than shortages i think inventory shortage is going to continue for another year right i'm at i would say 12 weeks okay to three months would be a good average now, the only thing that would speed that up is we have you know, some dealers that have the availability where they constantly have flow coming in, they project some orders, they still take them, but then they'll say, hey, I've got a 3121 standard build coming down line. Can you add dual pane windows and slide toppers for Mr. Jones? Mm -hmm. uh, and we say, okay, it's going to be online we can't make any changes when it's seven days from being online, you're asking for trouble. Right. But if it's at 10 to 14 and the dealer's got it coming down line and our vendors can get the parts, we'll make the changes. Nice. But uh, we don't expect everybody to always just get on the back of the line. But again, as you and I have talked, we got a lot of dealers also that are saying, I'm not gonna change my, my stock orders into retails. I need those stock units because I have nothing to show. Right. So basically we have a unit here that's getting ready for its front cap set. Uh, we insulate the full front end. We'll also pull over the reflective insulation. Uh, we didn't go up onto the decking area. Again, a lot of the wiring's pulled through the rafters. Our rafters are wood. Um, we actually insulate between the rafters. Then we put your 3 8 inch OSB. We put that down onto the roof. We then sand the seams. We actually do what some people call like uh, drywall tape or the webbing tape on each seam to try and help bridge that gap. 
because uh, there are a lot of people that say they, they perceive they should have no seams at all. That rubber roof, it's actually not rubber, excuse me, it's TPO. It does grow and contract. You will see seams. You will see some bubbles every now and then. And you go out in your hottest day and you're gonna see all of it disappear. So there is some of that, and especially since we went to TPO, TPO versus rubber cannot be stretched as tight. The advantages of TPO is it's colored all the way through and it can actually be embossed so it's slip resistant on the top. So you're gonna have less of that chalking situation. It won't absorb molds and mildews. So you're not gonna get up there and get a bunch of saplings growing in your roof line. So there's a lot of advantages to it, but we can't stretch it as much from side to side so it's not gonna have that opportunity to be tight all the time. Our front windshield units, we were one of the first, there was windshield units being built by other manufacturers, but when we wanted to do it, we got a patent on the actual windshield because one thing that's unique about it is a five point windshield. And that's why on Keystone products, you'll see it almost come down to a point because in the engineering side, we found that having that fifth point down there is so important in actually stopping it or making it flex less and having an opportunity to become unbonded. We do get a lot of questions, that black rubber thing around that actual windshield, that is not what's holding in your windshield. That windshield is bonded in just like an automotive windshield into the fiberglass cap. That's just actually filling that gap that's between those two. Okay. So, um, but again, they're gonna set that cap fully insulated behind it. And then they're gonna actually finish off the side rail, pull the actual rubber membrane and get all of that done. Things that have come in technology of slide outs has been a lot of the seal systems. Um, so for example, in the past, you know, years, years ago, you'd go to a dealership and you'd see seals hanging off the bottoms of the slide outs because we were relying on double sticky tape, things of that nature. Um, you can see that the, now the slide out seals, we use a double side flap seal. This is encapsulated into the rigid plastic. So there's, and then this entire cap this wall cap is screwed on. So literally this is a part that we've had ever in the history zero warranty on. There's no way for it to fail. Uh, there's no way for it to come apart. But that's where a lot of technology has helped. And also everybody wants their slide outs not to leak. So that not happening ever is probably not a possibility if in the infinity. But what we do here is, if you can imagine this being in, seals are here and water does get by water's going to run down the flat surface what we put on here is what i call a sugar scoop this half moon piece water runs down the wall and rather coming and hitting the back of your interior beautiful fascia it's going to hit this aluminum extrusion the water is then going to follow this aluminum extrusion down to the bottom in the drip cups yep. this is a piece you 99 percent of customers don't even realize is there this is not only ran down the side but it's ran all the way across the top and down the other side of your slide out boxes. The other thing we've done in the last couple of years that people will talk about when we're more inside is this change to the actual PVC woven flooring. That's sharp. We can put any design we want into it. It's the same thing that's been so uh, well done in the pontoon industry. The only difference here is they have an integrated carpet pad that allows it, gives it that insulation factor, that wear type thing. And again, here in the slide out, you can see we still insulate the floor with the Astrofoil to try and give you a little bit more of an insulation barrier. But again, this is practically indestructible. You can't, I mean, do anything to it. Um, and the reason we like it, some people are doing linoleum in the slide outs, but what ends up happening is linoleum is not made to flap over. You're gonna get wear, breaks and cracks in your linoleum. Right. So this is more, I can wad this up and do anything I want, whether it's smashed up against an island or gets underneath here, it's not going to crack and tear like Leno would. We have that, I like yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. We've got most of the exterior done. We're starting to put on exterior finishes, slides. We do offer slide toppers. You can see this model is actually built with the slide topper option. Um, we do that on any floor plan. You can also see some of the neat stuff that we've added again based on customer feedback. Again, magnetic door, right? People are concerned, it's gonna come down and smack me in the head. Right. We developed with a, a vendor a, an exclusive magnetic positive latch. So now this magnet actually pulls over the latch and it comes unlatched. So then basically I shouldn't have to tap it because it hasn't been used, but this will actually pull it across. And now there's no way for it, you saw it there, to come down on your head. Nice. Still magnetic, still no place to rust.
not on a, a positive metal latch like in the old days. So that's new for 2022. And I see they're still leaving the, the, the brackets on. So if somebody does decide to put a shock absorber assist on there, they can do that. And not only that, but what that does for the customer that he doesn't even realize is now we could not put these on this door, but guess what? Now we have two part numbers, two SKUs, a left and a right. And my models like this, this is the same door on either side. Right. So if the dealer decides he wants to stock a door, it actually can be replaced in two places. Okay. So that's the other reason why we leave these on because they're needed on the other side. That brings up a question that I saw posted today when I asked people on social media if they were going to have questions today. One lady actually asked if they can order a bigger door, if they wanted to retrofit and make a bigger compartment door. And I kind of scratched my head on that. Is that possible? Something that they can order? I wouldn't think it would be. No, and actually I answered that on the online and I know you haven't seen it, but okay. I, I suggest them just as you saw, if you remember when we were in lamination, all the way around this opening is aluminum tubing. Right. If you actually try and put a bigger door in, you're cutting aluminum tube structure. I, you know, I didn't think about that when I read yeah. the question. Yeah, you're absolutely I would, right. I would never do that. I would never suggest okay. doing that. We've had customers that really thought about cutting an additional, you know, hole for their window. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, you have to understand there's a really good chance. Any place we can take advantage of where there is solid wall, we're going to put a stud. Okay. So if you're going to put a window there, you're going to cut through a stud. So... This is one of the areas that we had talked about earlier was, you know, people say testing, quality, you guys aren't doing enough of it. This is actually a small box and this actually will actually test all of the brake lights. So this box gets put on every unit. They hook up the seven way plug. You can see the brake light switch, right, left, clearance lights. It's actually got a, a meter on the amps that it's pulling as stuff's being turned on and off to try and verify if there's any extra draw, stuff of that nature. This is done to every unit. And there's a person okay. that does that. Besides that, they're also going to have what we call a high pot test. And that's when all the electrical is done, same thing as in the actual residential mobile home industry. You put it through a high pot, which means there's going to be an amount of voltage and amperage put through the unit. And if there's a variation in it, it identifies you have a short somewhere. You okay. have a staple through a, a wire. wire. You have something. a pinched wire. Mm. Um, that's done. Besides, we're going to gas test it. We're going to flood test the tanks. We're going to flood test the showers, stuff of that nature, as it goes down line here. The one thing we can't duplicate is the 60 mile an hour to the dealership for you to take delivery of it. Yeah. How could you ever find time to do that? Yeah, and that's where we <laughs> really have to rely on our dealers is that right. pre-delivery check by the dealers. And quickly, again, you're, you're great on social media. That's one thing that customers are ready to expose, the dealers that don't want to get it ready for them don't want to prep, don't want to do a walkthrough. Right. They put it right there. And uh, our expectation is that's part of selling in Montana is giving the customer as much time as they want to get familiar with it. Right. And, so. you know, it's, it's sometimes it's a little discouraging to see somebody just automatically blame the manufacturer when what you just said, a lot of responsibility falls on that dealership to do a good PDI and to do a good walkthrough. And that's where I, I sometimes wonder when I read these questions, what's really going on here? Mm -hmm. Who's who's falling short? Mm -hmm. So, But if that customer's had the first pop-up he bought was just said, hey, you guys pick it up, and if you have any questions, let us know. And then the next trailer, he gets treated the same way. He His know. expectation is he knows no better. Right. It's like grab the owner's manuals and figure it out. That is not what we want the Montana customer to go through. And you. So as you've seen several times throughout the video, um, improvements are made on customer input. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of customer input for changes and improvements as well as research and development. And that's another department that we got to see while we were here. We just don't have time to show you all of that. We got to see their innovation department where the engineers develop the new things like Sam was talking about, um, the so, air conditioning and... Yeah, they just, you know, they put an idea out there and then they put it to test, see if it works, see if it doesn't, see if it's going to be something that they can implement. Yep, exactly. So um, we're going to move on to the third part of this video. So um, the link is here at the end. And if you want to go back to the first one as well, we'll leave the link here also. So we're going to move on to something that um, probably a lot of the women want to see at this point are the changes they've made on the inside of the coaches. So we're going to go tour a new 2020 
excuse me, a new 2022. We have a 2020. So a new 2022 with Sam, and he's going to show you and tell you about all the changes that have been made for the 2022 model year. I think a lot of you will be happy with what they've done. Yeah, they've made a lot of good improvements. And again, a lot of it is based on the things that we as the end users are telling Keystone. Yeah. So we'll see you over there. <laughs> 